This might look a little different this year. It's still Scranton, our home. And the place that connects us all together, no matter where we are. The Scranton community is proud of all that we can accomplish together. And is proud of the impact of tonight's honorees. Thank you to our students for that welcome and for giving us a glimpse of what campus looks like these days. The words you just saw were etched above the entrance of the DeNaples Campus Center at the request of University of Scranton President Father Scott R. Pilars during his first tenure as president. They were thoughtfully selected to capture the essence of the Scranton student experience. Those same words could just have accurately been carved above the entrance to Old Main in 1888 to describe the student experience that the Most Reverend William G. O'Hara, the first Bishop of Scranton, envisioned as he founded St. Thomas College, which would go on to become the University of Scranton. Bishop O'Hara happened or hoped that the college would become a beacon of education that would light up our Lackawanna Valley. Well, today, that beacon shines brightly around the globe, thanks to the over 51,000 University of Scranton alumni worldwide. And it is that shared Scranton student experience 
that connects us virtually tonight, across the generations and across the globe, in a world that so desperately desires to be connected, and a world that desperately needs more Scranton graduates. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the University of Scranton President's Business Council 19th Annual Award Celebration. For the previous 18 years, on a Thursday evening in October, over 550 university alumni, parents, friends, guests have gathered in the ballroom of the Pierre Hotel on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 61st Street in New York City to celebrate our university, to support our students, and to recognize individuals for their career achievements and their demonstrated extraordinary compassion for others. Tonight, we bring you that event in a, in a virtual setting. Our event link is open to the public and provides us with an opportunity to allow those of you who haven't had a chance to join us in person to experience just what has been happening in that ballroom for the past 18 years. As we get started, let me first acknowledge the music of Wycliffe Gordon that played over our congratulatory slideshow. Wycliffe is an internationally re renowned musician, composer, arranger, band leader, music educator, but most importantly, an honorary degree recipient of the university's class of 2006. We are grateful for his participation tonight, and we will hear more from Wycliffe at the end of tonight's program. Allow me to show you around our event page through which you are viewing tonight's program. As those of you who have been with us in person know, we come into tonight with pledges and payments committed to, for student scholarships. And true to our in-person event, our fundraising efforts will continue through tonight's program. For those of you who would like to make a gift, you can do so via the donate button on your screen, which opens a pop-up window. Or if you prefer to use your phone for the text to give option, you can text PBC, your name, your gift amount to 91999. There is a fundraising thermometer viewable by selecting that option on the top of your screen, which will open a new tab in your browser. That number is being updated real time as gifts come in. While this event historically raises over $1 million, we have been reluctant to write in a final goal number. Try getting that by a Scranton accountant who happens to be the global chief compliance officer of J.P. Morgan Chase. So let's see what we can do tonight. We are very grateful for the generous support that we have received thus far for our student scholarships. But I know there are a few folks watching tonight who registered and selected, I will consider my gift at a later time. We hope that you will consider making your gift tonight. Finally, we also introduced a few silent auction items this year, and that auction has been live since Tuesday. The silent auction is available by scrolling to the bottom of the screen and selecting View Silent Auction, which will open another tab in your browser where you can view items, place, and monitor your bids. We plan to close the auction tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, which will be around 20 minutes from the end of tonight's program. If you encounter any technical issues while you're watching or you want to pledge a gift, you can feel free to text me at 570-575-1588. Or email pbc at scranton.edu. I know of a few watch parties for tonight's event, so I hope that you have settled in with your Scrantini or your drink of choice, as I have. Cheers. To begin our program, there is no better place to start than with our students. A small group of members of the University of Scranton Singers and a few university alumni under the direction of Cheryl Boga will perform the alma mater as a new four-part a cappella choral arrangement 
written by Joseph Boga. The alma mater will be followed by our PBC chair, Frank Pern, of the class of 1983. Take it away, Cheryl. The hours too quickly slip away and mingle into years, but memories of our stranding days will last whatever next appears. The legacy from those before is briefly ours to hold. We leave the best behind for others. As the coming years unfold, with faith and lives that touch us here and past that ours have crossed, we know that reaching for the rising sun is surely worth the cost. May God be ever at our side. May goodness fill our day. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to our performance music students for that rendition of the university's alma mater. I would also like to call out and thank Cheryl Boga, director of the university's performance music program, for her dedication to our university students for over three decades. On behalf of myself and our PBC vice chair, Elizabeth Madden, the class of 1996, I want to welcome you to the President's Business Council 19th Annual Award Celebration. I'm coming to you from an empty ballroom at the Pierre Hotel in New York. Normally, we'd have a packed house tonight with alumni and friends of the university celebrating and raising money for our presidential scholarships. However, as we continue in these unprecedented times and move forward through this pandemic, it is important for us to continue with the good works that the President's Business Council has done for nearly 20 years. As we tried to predict what the pandemic would look like in October, it was clear that any in-person gathering for our annual dinner would not be possible. We also felt that putting our fundraising initiative on hold this year was also not an option, given the continued need for the university to generate scholarship funds in support of our students. While many things in the world today are being done virtual, money to fund scholarships and student need can't be. As I've said many times, cash is king. We are grateful for the continued financial support that so many have shown thus far, especially from our annual core donors, most notably our previous medal recipients. We would not have been able to proceed this year without the confidence of knowing that you would be there for the PBC and the university. We're excited about this year's edition of our annual dinner as a virtual PBC celebration, and we are extremely grateful to our honorees for agreeing to be such a special part of it. This year's honorees are individuals who have achieved excellence in their fields and who live their lives inspired by the Jesuit values through their extraordinary compassion for others. Maggie and John Mariotti and Monsignor Joe Quinn are wonderful recipients for tonight's honor. They each have achieved success in their respective careers, but more importantly, they have generously and graciously shared their talents, gifts, and insights as valued members of the university community. I've been privileged to know Maggie, John, and Monsignor Quinn for many years, and I couldn't be happier that we are honoring them this evening. The PBC has generated over $16 million for the Presidential Scholarship Endowment Fund, which supports full tuition, merit-based scholarships at the university. In an effort to recognize these extraordinary times and to increase the number of students who will benefit from tonight's event, a portion of this year's proceeds will also be designated to the James P. Sweeney SJ Family Outreach Fund for students facing unexpected financial hardship, and as a way of recognizing Father Pilar's leadership to the Scott R. Pilar's SJ Scholarship, a need-based scholarship established by Joe Cerbera and his family. For those of you who have been with us at the Pierre 
will recall that we continue to raise money during the evening through our Text to Give program. We will continue this effort tonight and our virtual platform has made giving so much easier by allowing you to donate right from the screen in front of you. To donate, simply need to text PBC, your name and your gift amount to 91999. And after several years of trying to convince Tim Pryle that we should add a silent auction, I'm very pleased to say that tonight we have a few auction items for you to bid on. So if you haven't yet made a contribution, we hope that you will consider doing so during the program. And for those many of you that have already made your contribution, thank you. And I want to ask that you might consider increasing it and certainly bidding on some of those exciting silent auction items. The thermometer on our screen will allow all of us to track our fundraising progress tonight. So thank you again for joining us. I hope that you've settled in with your Scrantini or your beverage of choice. I certainly have. Now I'm happy to turn it over to our university president, Father Scott R. Pilars of the Society of Jesus. As I do, I want to thank Father for his continued leadership of the university, particularly during these challenging times, and also for his unwavering commitment to the PBC. Father Pilars? Thank you, Frank. Not only for that introduction, but also for your leadership of the PBC. You have also been a great leader for the university, and I'm grateful for my friendship with you and Sue. Being together with you and so many Scranton friends is something I will always cherish and something I really miss tonight. I'm going to show my age and the age of most people in this room when I tell you that a line from a song made famous by Joni Mitchell has been running through my mind these days. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? See, I can quote from artists other than Bruce Springsteen. We have all given up a lot in these past months, so much of it for the common good. Personally, while it is so good to see many of you tonight watching with us, I can't help but wish we could all be together. One consolation is that the Scranton spirit and the ties that bind us to one another and the university can't be broken, not even by a global pandemic. T tonight we gather in spirit from all over the country and the world. Tonight we celebrate what is best about Scranton. Our honorees tonight, Maggie and John Mariotti and Monsignor Quinn, are great examples of the best about Scranton. Ours is a university committed to building community. And I've known few people more committed to building community than these great friends, Maggie, John, and Joe. Monsignor chaired the search committee that had the audacity to pluck someone out of the classroom with no administrative experience and whose scholarly life was dedicated to 16th century poetry. Only Joe Quinn would have an imagination big enough to make me the president of the University of Scranton. I'll never forget calling my parents in March of 2003 to tell them that I'd been elected as president. My father said, president of what? The president of the University of Scranton, I replied. There was a slight pause before he quipped, do they know that you've never figured out how to balance your checkbook? That's true enough. But under the tutelage of generous people like Joe, Maggie, and John, I have learned a lot. Maggie and John were my own special Scranton welcome wagon. They never tired of explaining the tangled web of Scranton families, who's married to whose cousin and why I would get a laugh every time I mentioned Manuka. More importantly, their love for Scranton was contagious. Tonight we celebrate the fact that all of us love this place. All in, I've lived here for 11 years. That's one more year than Joe Biden. And while I love New York City, I'd choose Scranton over Park Avenue any day. 
Every time I'm asked what's so special about Scranton, both the university and the city, I fall back to a line spoken by a former president's medal recipient and a Scranton parent, Joe Sorbera. Scranton is the kind of place where if anybody falls, everybody stops to help them up again. Tonight is all about helping people rise up, mainly our presidential scholars. Through your generosity, we can recruit and retain the very best students. They act like a leaven on our campus. They set the bar high, and all of those around them rise up to our challenges, intellectual, spiritual, and all the other ways that Scranton students do amazing things as they set the world on fire. You gathered here tonight virtually make this Scranton reality possible. As you know, these are highly unusual times for the world, our nation, and the university we love. I believe that love is stronger and deeper now than ever. Students, faculty, alumni, benefactors, and families have shown their love for Scranton. You have all been asked to do hard deeds. As the poet Tennyson put it, come my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now, that strength which in old days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. That, my friends, is what we celebrate tonight, one equal temper of heroic hearts, hearts filled with love for our university, and hearts that will never yield to the challenges of our time. Let me end with a line from a 16th century poet, Shakespeare in Twelfth Night. I can no other answer make but thanks, and thanks, ever thanks. God bless you, God bless Catholic and Jesuit education, and God bless the University of Scranton. Thank you. Thank you, Father Pilars, for your inspirational stewardship of our university. Each year we have the opportunity to hear from one of our presidential scholars who gives us insight into what the presidential scholarship has meant to them. Tonight we have gathered five presidential scholars from the class of 2021 who will share their stories with us. Our PBC Vice Chair, Elizabeth Madden, will introduce us to the group of outstanding students. Elizabeth? Thank you, Frank. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this evening. I've had the benefit of being involved with the PBC since the very beginning and watching our growth over all the years. Thank you to all of you who have made tonight happen, especially virtually. I've also had the privilege of knowing so many of our medal recipients and wanted to offer my personal congratulations to Maggie, John, and Monsignor. One of my other privileges has been getting to know the students over the years and really understanding the impact this scholarship has had with them. Meeting them over the years has been heartwarming and inspirational. And we thought this evening, it would be nice for you to hear the stories directly from them. Let me introduce you to a few of our presidential scholars from the class of 2021. Hi, I'm Amanda Talvesa. I'm from Springfield, Pennsylvania. I went to Sacred Heart Academy Bryn Mawr, and I major in English and philosophy with minors in history, business, and writing. Um, I'm in SGLA, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Spree. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Graff. I'm from Huntington, New York. I went to St. Anthony's High School. I was an accounting major with a concentration in forensic accounting and a concentration in business analytics, as well as the secretary of Beta Alpha Psi and president of Omega Beta Sigma. I'm currently a master's student in the Master's of Accountancy program with a concentration in forensic accounting. Hello friends, I'm Jacob Myers from Bluebell PA. 
I went to Abington Friends School for high school uh, at Scranton. I'm a BCMB major with a minor in philosophy. I'm a member of the Honors Program and the Magis STEM Honors Program. I'm applying to MD-PhD programs this cycle. I'm to work as a physician scientist. On campus, I've had the opportunity to serve on, um, as a residential senator in student government for the last three years, um, and I've been the research chair in HPO for the last two. Off campus, I've had the opportunity to serve uh, the community through my involvement as a scribe at the Leahy Clinic and singing at St. Luke's Episcopal downtown. Hello, I'm Megan Osborne. I'm from Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and I'm from Central Columbia High School. Here at the university, I am a mathematics major with a minor in education. I am also currently the president of the math club, and hopefully if everything goes according to plan, I'll be assistant directing a show with Leva Arts Company next semester. Hello, my name is Molly Elkins. I'm from Owings, Maryland. I am a biochemistry cell and molecular biology major with a double major in philosophy, a minor in theology, and a concentration in Catholic studies. Um, I am involved in three honors programs, SJLA, the honors program, and Magis honors program in STEM. I volunteer in the community at Geisinger Community Medical Center, the Jewish home of Eastern Pennsylvania, and I have leadership roles on campus in Alpha Sigma Nu, HPO, and Students for Life. Tell us a little bit about how the scholarship has impacted your studies at Scranton and beyond. I'm just very grateful that I got to be here. Um, without the scholarship, I wouldn't have, you know, been able to pursue my education with, uh, as freely as I think that the scholarship has allowed me to. And it's also, it's opened up new opportunities just with friendships, like social stuff, relationships with, relationships with professors. Um, I'm doing research with one of my English professors currently, and you know, who knows if that would have been possible if I hadn't been given the opportunities that the Presidential Scholarship allowed me to receive. For me, I wanted to add how grateful I am for the career services and the internship director here at Scranton over my time. Um, because of them really directly having a big impact in this, I've had an internship with the Department of Justice. I was able to do that over the summer in New York City, and then I was able to transfer that to downtown Scranton and do it during the semester. So that was a really great opportunity. And then most recently over the summer, I had a virtual internship at Grant Thornton, and I have a job lined up now in the fall as an audit associate in their Melville office. So all of that's really been possible to the connections that I've made in Scranton. Presidential scholarship and my time at Scranton have given me an unrivaled education uh, in science, supplemented by a really robust background in the humanities and philosophy and theology and a bunch of other fields. And this, experiment ha this experience has allowed me to participate in several research programs funded through the NSF over the last several years. This past summer, I had the opportunity to work uh, determining how long SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, survives on surfaces in order to better understand its transmission. Uh, and our group is moving to publish these results um, and should do so in the next month or two. Um, and I am really thrilled that I sort of had the opportunity to do all of this work thanks to the Presidential Scholarship and thanks to Scranton. So when I started here at the university, I was originally a math education major and my plan at the time was to be a high school teacher. Um, over the course of my time here, and with the support of all of the professors I met in the math department, I became more interested in pursuing math um, primarily, and I'm currently applying to PhD programs for it. Um, and I think without the scholarship and without the ability to take classes, um, kind of without repercussion, I'm not sure if I would have been brave enough to make that switch and transition. <laughs> The biggest impact besides the, the lifting of the financial burden has been allowing me to take classes on um, during off time, so in intercession and during summer, which has given me a lot of more time during the semester to take classes that really interest me, um, such as my humanities classes, philosophy, theology. It's really allowed me to broaden my horizons and helped form me into a person that wants to be a, a caring and an ethical uh, physician and scientist. And I don't think taking these classes would have been possible without the Presidential Scholarship. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to spend my time at Scranton here with that. You have the opportunity right now to talk to the people that made this happen. What do you want to say to them? 
I would just say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. I truly would not be here unless or without this scholarship. Um, and it's it's just given me um, like some of the best four years of my life for being able to come here. I would really like to express how grateful I am for receiving the scholarship. Me and my family were big believers and everything happens for a reason and things kind of work out. So the scholarship kind of sent me on a path on with my major, with opportunities, with networking, with friends that I've made within this group, within other classes that I've had here. Um, I think that my life has been pretty drastically changed because of the scholarship and because of attending the University of Scranton. And I'm really grateful for that and how great it's been turning out. Thank you. And I'd just like to say a, a big thank you. Um, you know, I really wouldn't have had the, the opportunities that I have received um, without this scholarship. I wouldn't have made the friends that I have. I wouldn't have been able to, to do the, the research and the, um, a lot of the, some, of the, some of the service off campus, some of the, the work that I do um, on campus uh, with, without it. It has been in, incredibly freeing and allowed me to do and pursue really what, whatever I wanted and whatever I felt important um, on campus. And so for that, I, I just have to express my, my, my deepest, deepest gratitude. Um, it is really profoundly impacted uh, how I have been able to pursue my time at Scranton um, and, and everything else. I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to attend Scranton. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that without the scholarship, um, there's no possible way I would have been able to come here. So I'm incredibly grateful for the experiences and the connections I've made here. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for the opportunities. The scholarship has allowed me to come to Scranton. I, I would not have come here without it. Um, and Scranton has just really, allowed me to pursue excellence, excellence in academics, excellence in friendships, excellence in my spirituality. So I'm forever grateful to be, to be able to attend uh, because of this scholarship. And it's also lifted a huge financial burden, allowing me to really realistically pursue medical school with minimal debt. So I will be grateful the rest of my life for this scholarship. I must say that all of us listening this evening must just be um, incredibly touched uh, motivated uh, and inspired by what you have been able to accomplish and uh, really what's in front of you. Um, I, I, I hope on behalf of the PBC and again all of us listening this evening that um, we will see you as future leaders of the PBC. Best of luck and congratulations. Thank you. As we begin our second half of the program, Let's take a retrospective look at all of our past President's Medal recipients.
Now let's turn to this evening's honorees and learn about Maggie and John from some of those who know them best. Three words or phrases to describe John and Maggie. Well, full of life. They're the kind of people that are so welcoming. You feel like you've been friends with them forever. John and Maggie complement each other in many ways. They're able to bring their sense of humor to the table and their trust in each other. Tremendously honest and open. They're incredibly generous, loving, warm. Very empathetic people and they take care of each other and they take care of others. Maggie as an audiologist, John as an orthodontist. John went to the University of Scranton as a proud graduate and that's where he met Maggie when he came here. So I've known John and Maggie since they dated in college and uh, John initially thought he was marrying a fabulous young lady from Scranton. He didn't realize that he would be married uh, by her brother Joe, that he would practice for a quarter of a century with her older brother Tony, and that the other 10 of us would show up for, for dinner every Sunday. John is also incredibly kind. My partner for 35 years, complete gentleman, and a brilliant orthodontist. I think he's a great husband and a great father. I share with John a special bond. We both grew up in South Jersey, uh, so we bring a certain uh, point of view together to some of the things that we've experienced here. He's compassionate. Uh, and he's dedicated to his family. He's very welcoming, and he looks to find a way to communicate with people and understand what they're about and solve problems together. He's very generous, and he loves good food. <laughs> Maggie is bright. She's selfless. Confident. Energetic. Super magnetic. Beautiful. Beyond hardworking. Family-oriented. And she is a very ethical person. I met Maggie when I was a student at Marywood College. She was a professor, but she was also the head of the audiology clinic on campus. As a freshman, we would spend time observing in the clinic and watching Maggie treat patients and interact with people. Um, it was really what influenced me into going down a career path of audiology. She is able to create a connection with the patient. So while providing top-notch hearing health care, she also creates a bond with each and every one of her patients. Both of them have a wonderful way to connect to people and take care of people, and I think both of them do a wonderful job in their professions that they have chosen. John is um, someone who's helped a lot of my friend's children get perfect teeth and um, to care about their personal health. They're great representatives of the Scranton community because the students who come to the University of Scranton, whether for undergrad or graduate, you know, they get to see a representation of Scranton, uh, especially through board members, and I think they represent us really well. They really embraced me when I first came here, and I didn't quite know it at the time, but I think they kind of adopted me as a project, and the project was to get me to know the Scranton community, and uh, they could not have been a greater help to me when I first got here, and they continue to be. Uh, Maggie served on the board, certainly, uh, most of the time that I was president. And uh, John joined our board this year. And their view and their wisdom as members of the board is, is so valuable because they love this place, first of all, and everything they do is out of that love, but also because they know this community better than most. They are very focused on the rounded out experience of the student and I think that the reason they are that way is because they were wonderful students themselves. John and Maggie have both been very active in this community. Recently when our niece, uh, Bridget Kozorowski, decided to run for state senator, she went to one person, Maggie, asked her to run her campaign. Maggie and I are very close and I'm her oldest niece and I was a nurse for 26 years and the University of Scranton was doing a program called Ready to Run and it was to encourage women to run for office. And my Aunt Maggie, I think she, she didn't ask me, I think she told me I had to go to this. So I, I was here at the university at the Ready to Run program and it was baptism by fire for both of us as a candidate and as she was my campaign manager. She believes in people and she believed in me. And she was successful in her first run for office. We, we won, we won the race as uh, the first female in 55 years from Lackawanna County to take the seat. When asked to do something, both of them say yes. They've raised their children here, they're still living here, they're dedicated to the area, and the area's better because of them. Men and Women for Others is always a common theme that we talk about at the President Business Council. 
And Maggie and John do that every day. Two of the most important things that I've learned in life, I learned from Maggie and John. I think one of the most important things was the wine to culture ratio. And that is when you're traveling, you need to have a ratio where for every museum you visit, you need to visit two enotecas. That's the proper ratio. And then there comes the rule of golf. I always thought a round of golf was 18 holes. John and Maggie taught me that a round of golf is only 14 holes. And the next four holes are the after party. There are two rules to live by. And I learned those from Maggie and John. Maggie and John deserve to be recognized because of who they, who they are as a couple, what they've done together as a couple. They are extremely proud of the University of Scranton Jesuit education. John, I know, feels a very strong attachment to the Jesuits and what they've done for him. And they're wonderful representations and advocates. They could go anywhere in the country, uh, and I would bet they talk about the University of Scranton in Scranton. Their commitment to the university is, is really edifying. It, it builds me up. It helps me uh, strengthen the bonds of my own commitment. And I see their willingness to put in the time and energy uh, that they have and continue to do, it's inspiring. Uh, and for that, I, I thank them so much. I did always remind John, since he was coming into a, a rather large family, of the great comedic line that uh, success is relative. The more success you have in life, the more relatives that you will see. Congratulations, Maggie and John. Well deserved. Maggie, John, congratulations could not have honored better people. Maggie and John, we're so proud of you, and thanks for all that you've done for our community. And I can't wait to make it up with a dinner with you because this is a virtual dinner, I understand. So congratulations, you deserve it. Maggie and John, I can't tell you how proud I am of both of you. Well done. Thanks for being there every step of the way. Congratulations, Maggie and John. I can't think of two people more deserving of this honor. Mom and Dad, congratulations on the award. In the weeks leading up to this event, it's become increasingly clear to me that this award is a really big deal, which is fitting because you guys are a really big deal to us and to everyone. So congratulations on this impressive honor. We're so proud of you. Congratulations, Mom and Dad, for this incredible honor. I'm so proud of you. You've always taught us the importance of education and of giving back, so I can't imagine two more deserving people. Congratulations, Mom and Dad. We absolutely adore you. We are so thrilled for you tonight. Uh, you have always been our inspiration and role models, and you continue to be so with this award. We love you. You are both, and Uncle Joe, such incredible embodiments of the University of Scranton's mission. And you inspire me as an alumni to every day try and go out and set the world on fire. Congratulations. We love you and congratulations. Please welcome Maggie and John Mariotti. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Father Perlars, Frank Pern, and all who made this evening possible, especially Tim Pryle. It is an honor and a privilege to receive this medal. Maggie and I are thrilled to receive it. The PBC, the President's Business Council, works hard each year to raise monies for scholarships allowing students to attend the University of Scranton. It is especially an honor for me, as 49 years ago, I was awarded a scholarship to the University of Scranton. This enabled my parents to send me here as I was the first person in my family to receive a college education. A bit of history. All four of my grandparents immigrated to the United States from Italy in 1920, through Ellis Island, and eventually settling in New Jersey. My own parents were born shortly thereafter, and they never had an opportunity to attend college. Therefore, I am forever, ever, forever grateful to the university for my education. The process of my being here began with an interview in the senior year of high school. None other than another PBC recipient, Father Bernard McElhaney, 
was the director of admissions at the time. He was in his 40s then, and imagine 50 years later, he's still a presence on the university. He's amazing. Congratulations, Father. The president of the university at that time was uh, Dexter Hanley. And the president of the student body was a young, red-haired senior student who became an attorney, a federal magistrate, a diocesan priest, a monsignor, my brother-in-law, <laughs> and a very close friend, Monsignor Joseph Quinn, another recipient tonight. Obviously, I married his sister Maggie, who I met when she was a cashier at a local supermarket. More on the food theme of my life to follow. <laughs> Maggie and I <clears throat> actually ended up having our re wedding reception on the University of Scranton campus at the old student center, which I believe now is Dion Green. Our wedding reception was canceled uh, because it was an outdoor venue due to rain. And obviously we know there's a few rainy days in Scranton. I quickly realized that the rule of six degrees of separation for most of the world that, follow, that follows this six degree rule does not apply to Scranton. There are about two degrees, if you're lucky. By the time I was a, a junior at the university, women were offered admission here and it was a game changer. The university was even more balanced and a new energy had arrived. As an aside, lots of marriages ensued and a number of university graduate husband and wives now send their children to the university. Brilliant move on the university's part. I've often thought there's a secret sauce that the university has, a special feeling that con it conveys to all that are here. This sauce, this feeling, this intangible is seasoned by the faculty and the staff and the students and administration. To continue the cooking analogy, as all things in my life refer to cooking <laughs> and food, as you may can tell, the presidents of the university have been master chefs in this final sauce making. But I think that the ultimate chef a Michelin five-star award-winning chef is our own Father Scott Pilars. He brings to campus and the university a remarkable energy, motivating the community to treat each other with love and respect. In a presentation to the Board of Trustees that I, recently privileged, that I was recently privileged to hear, a senior student referred to this feeling as a Scranton day meaning all was right with the world and everything would work out to be just fine. This is a feeling we could all benefit from these days. This night is really about the students and the scholarship recipients, past, present, and future. They all have become members of the university family and being part of any family is a blessing. This reminds me of one of my favorite quotes about family from the Spanish-American philosopher Jorge Santillana. Family is one of nature's great masterpieces. As young 18-year-olds, students leave their families to begin their quest forward into the world. It is reassuring that they will be nourished during this journey by the masterpiece of the University of Scranton family. Again, thanks for this honor. Hope to see everyone next year at the Pierre. Good job. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for this honor. My story is a bit different from John's, and my first awareness of the University of Scranton was watching my three older brothers, Tony, Peter, and Joe, take their lunches and walk to college. We grew up over in, on the south side of Scranton and could see the university from our family home. I am number six of 12 children, 
And my parents felt they had one great responsibility, and that was to educate all of us. John and June Quinn were remarkable parents, and they educated all of us. When I graduated from high school, women were not yet allowed to apply for admission to the university. So the fact that I thought my older brothers made their lunches and walked to college was not that unusual. I will fast forward to the year 2000 when John and I invited the very young new president, Father Scott Pilars, to our home to meet some of our friends and neighbors who had their start at the university. That day, Father Pilars and I talked about distance learning as I was in an audiology doctoral dist distance learning program through the University of Florida at the time. Father Pilars was not a fan of distance learning, but he was open to the discussion. Shortly after, some of the graduate and doctoral level programs here developed an online presence, but he was still committed to the exchange of ideas in person learning from each other in this great community. A year later, he invited me to join the Board of Trustees at the university, and we became fast friends. I was fortunate to meet and to learn from many dedicated trustees over my two terms. And in my first term, Kip Condren, who was the chairman of the board at the time, had the first PBC dinner at the Pierre Hotel in New York City, and we were off to the races. This dinner was a huge networking opportunity for Scranton grads, and at the same time celebrated the Presidential Scholars, giving us all an opportunity to hear their accomplishments and their dreams for the future. Who would have thought that 20 years later, the entire world, from kindergarten through college, would have to resort to distance learning. Thankfully, the university was ready for the challenge. Maybe because Father Pilars was so young, or maybe because he so deeply believed in Jesuit education, he went on a building spree here in Scranton while I was a trustee, changing the face and the footprint of the U and pulling it into the 21st century. Our friendship has lasted through it all, and we were so delighted when he was brought back for a second term as president. He will continue to do great things for us here, and at the same time, he will motivate these students even in a virtual world. Again, thank you so much for this honor. When I met John as a 19-year-old supermarket checker, we never envisioned this. This medal and your friendship make our commitment to the University of Scranton even stronger. Thanks again. Congratulations, Maggie and John, and thank you for your thoughtful remarks. Now let's learn a little bit more about Monsignor Joseph Quinn from some of his family and friends. Joe, spiritual, charismatic, thoughtful, holy, courageous, honest, joyful, joyful, and joyful. My Uncle Joe has always been very caring, very compassionate. He motivates you. You're inspired by his example. Great priest, wonderful friend and incredibly invested in the University of Scranton. Always very generous, giving. He is bright, he is articulate. Joe has great empathy with uh, dealing with, uh, with people as a priest. A man of great principle, a tremendous integrity. Monsignor Joseph Quinn probably, in my mind, has the record in Northeastern Pennsylvania for number of appearances on video tributes uh, to other people. Uh, it's really incredible. Uh, and I remember once Monsignor was saying kind things about me on a, a video, um, but he added that in his mind, uh, a humble Jesuit was an oxymoron. Um, but I'm going to let that go today, and I'm going to take the high road uh, and say good things about our good friend Monsignor Quinn. 
There's a phrase used in economics, uh, a rising tide raises all ships. Joe Quinn is the type of guy that if you're with him in a personal matter or professional matter or a civic matter, he's going to raise all the ships. He's a rising tide. He makes you feel good again. And he understands the wisdom in being able to laugh at oneself and, uh, and to bring humor into situations that sometimes are a little bit difficult and need to be diffused. Living a, a joyful life is possible. He shows us that all the time. Joe was the perfect child. Now, Peter and I were older. We were the imperfect ones. To me, Joe is the glue that holds this large family together. And I think he plays that same role for many families across the University of Scranton. Joe was a good student. He was a great pianist. Peter and I were more uh, troublemakers. I remember Michael Joe, he was an attorney and working in Scranton. When he was 25 years old, he was named as a federal magistrate. Uh, the youngest in the country. He had a very distinguished career in the law profession, and he was recognized as a leader in the community. He was on this path, we thought, to go into politics. And one night, he asked us all to go to down the entire family to the, down to the uh, Scranton Club. And he said, I'm going to go to Rome. And we all thought, oh, for a couple of weeks, maybe we'll go over. And then he added, for four years. And then he added, to become a priest. I first met Monsignor Quinn getting off a bus at the North American College in Rome. We were classmates, and so we would go to the university each day together. We often uh, sat in the same row, uh, wrote notes home while we were supposed to be paying attention. And I got to know Joe both as a friend and also, uh, and I still see him this way, as, a, as an older brother in the priesthood. When I heard Monsignor Quinn was choosing a path to the priesthood. I was not surprised. He was the youngest federal magistrate in the United States at the time, but when he chose that path to a holy life, uh, he was already leading a holy life, and this just solidified what I think a lot of us knew all along. Joe, Joe Quinn was destined to be a priest and uh, an excellent priest at that. One of the things that I truly admire about Monsignor Quinn uh, is the fact that he loves being a priest. He loves being a pastor. And with all of his personal gifts that we're so familiar with, um, at the very rock bottom uh, of all those gifts uh, is this foundation in faith uh, and his love of being a priest. Monsignor himself always says that his, uh, his route to the priesthood was somewhat circuitous, but his heart is that common thread in his vocation. At a moment where we were in great need here at Fordham, we needed a vice president for mission and ministry. And when he came, uh, he was his usual terrific self, good humor always, fabulous preacher, very pastoral in every encounter that he had with students, staff, faculty, it didn't matter. When I first met Joe, it was at the board meeting, and he had never met me, which is unusual for Joe Quinn because he knows everyone. And the first thing he said to me is, how come I don't know who you are? He said, because I fly below the radar screen, which made him laugh, which is what Joe's about. He wants to know people's stories. I think that Joe should be recognized not only for what he does for the University of Scranton, which he's done his whole career, but what he does for this community. He was one of the starters of the Scranton plan, which advanced the city. He was one of the starters of the Lackawanna Heritage Valley, which has put these beautiful trails throughout the valley. He remains attached, he remains committed uh, to the cause, to the people. One of the big things was the uh, developing a campus because we were beginning to outgrow ourselves here. So one of the first things we needed, of course, was a little campus. And Joe saw that and, uh, of course, right away, he wrote to the, uh, the city council there, recommending in a very nice letter, I think he still have it, about the uh, uh, university and the need for developing that uh, street there and uh, creating that. Wherever he has gone, uh, he has had a, a profound effect on the community. The spotlight should be turned on him because he does personify all that is right and good about Northeastern Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Monsignor Quinn. Well deserved. Monsignor Joe, congratulations. There's no one more deserving. 
look forward to many more years working with you. Thank you, Uncle Father Joe, for all you do. Congratulations. Love you very much. Joe, I couldn't be more proud of you than I am. Uh, as the oldest and hanging out here as long as I can, you are everything that I admire. It's been a, truly an honor for me to come back with one of my students there years and years and years later to be able to be here to honor him and to tell him how much he means to us for all he's done, how much we appreciate him, how much we appreciate all he's done for so many people, what he has done especially for me. To me, he is a brother, a pastor, a mentor, but most importantly, a good friend. Joe, sincere congratulations. It's taken us a while to get you up on stage. You deserve this moment. I appreciate all the wonderful things you've done for the university and for the Scranton community. Again, sincere congratulations. Well, I cannot congratulate you enough, Monsignor Quinn. I'm sure that this entire evening was a little bit like attending your own wake, um, but uh, this isn't two to four, seven to nine. Congratulations to you on this uh, wonderful, wonderful award. And thanks for all that you've done for uh, the Cosgroves and for the community uh, of Northeastern Pennsylvania. Joe, congratulations. This is a well-deserved honor and I am proud to be able to say that you are a dear friend and a great colleague and also a role model for me. Joe, for all that you have been and all that you continue to be to the University of Scranton, to the Diocese of Scranton, and to the broader community of Northeastern and North Central Pennsylvania and well beyond, congratulations for a well-deserved honor. We are so grateful for the blessing of your ministry. Please welcome Monsignor Joseph Quinn. Thank you, Father Pilars, and thank you, Frank Perns. It is indeed a new world, and only your extraordinary team of Tom McKinnon and Tim Prow could make this happen and make the virtual somehow feel real. I mean, who would ever believe that we could take the university's own magnificent Condren Tower, so appropriately named after the legendary Kip and Peggy Condren, who, as Maggie noted in 2001, established and ever since have sustained this annual gathering of the President's Business Council and transform it into Scranton's own uh, Hotel Pierre. Simply amazing. Somehow I feel like I'm across the street from Central Park right now, even though I'm only a block from Nayog, but I'm grateful to be here wherever we are. As Maggie and uh, my brother-in-law John have so warmly and eloquently put of it, the three of us really are deeply humbled by the honor that you have accorded us, Father. I trust you know that all three of us are far more comfortable honoring than being honored. In fact, that's primarily because we come from large families that somehow are accustomed to keeping you humbled rather than applauding you. All seven of my sisters, uh, as do all four of my brothers, know that well. For our parents somehow made sure that we always remained humbled. And if that wasn't enough as to what they did, then when we headed off for Jesuit education, uh, it was underscored only all the more so with their foundational principle of AMDG, Ad Maiorum Dei Glorium, which translates to, it's not about you, it's about giving glory to God. And if that wasn't enough to underscore staying humble, in Jesuit high schools we learned the disciplinary practice called JUG, J-U-G, which I later learned didn't mean justice under God. It meant, and I think we all understand this tonight, Jesuits understand gratitude. And I'm sure that all are grateful for the support and the encouragement given by so many as we gather here tonight. And yet, as I humbly gather with all of you on this very special night, it really is gratitude that fills my heart as I reflect upon the enormously graced gift of a Jesuit education. And my ongoing affiliation with all things Jesuit, uh, what that has been for me throughout my life. 
So much so that some people actually call me a Jesuit. Not too sure what it means, but I'm always flattered to think that they think I'm connected. But I really have been so very blessed to have had 12 years of Jesuit education in my life. Beginning in 1964 at Scranton Prep, John mentioned Father McElhaney, but in 1964, when I met him, he was the headmaster of the school at Scranton Prep. And as John and Maggie both agree, it's just amazing that Father McElhaney, a prior recipient of this wonderful honor, is still here and still teaching us. After that chapter, it was on to the beloved University of Scranton, then under the leadership of Father Galvin and then later Father Hanley. A decade later, I would undertake my priestly formation at the renowned Gregorian University in Rome. And in between, it would be a great privilege for me to serve as a university trustee for more than 15 years, working alongside outstanding servant leaders like Father Byron, Father Pruniska, and then, of course, the singular Father McShane. It was during Father McShane's tenure at Scranton that I would first meet the then very young Father Scott Pollars. He was a trustee at that time. And you won't be surprised when I tell you this, but from the very first time you first met him, he was impressive in every way, and now only all the more so. When it was announced in 2002 that Father McShane would be moving on to serve as the president at Fordham, I was asked by our board of trustees chairman at the time, Frank McDonnell, to head up the presidential search committee. And it was readily clear to me and to many other trustees that our next president was right there in our midst, fellow trustee, Father Pilars. As we all know, Father's first term serving as our president from 2003 through 2011 was a resounding success in every way. An ambitious fundraising campaign raised far more than its goal of $125 million. Our campus was subsequently transformed with a new student center, two new dormitories, and an extraordinary new science center. With his visionary focus, his creative enthusiasm, and his truly charismatic spirit, Father Pilars did transform, but not only our campus, but our community and our culture, and all for the better. But eight years of breathless change was hardly enough time for him, which is why we were so delighted and still are to have welcomed him back to Scranton, this outstanding servant leader just a little over two years ago. This time around, Father has continued to transform the University of Scranton, perhaps even more so by way of his own inspirational spirit as he bears heavy crosses in his life with such courage and such a genuine spirit of selflessness. He so decisively leads Scranton through the pandemic that has compelled each and all of us to reflect even more so upon our lives and what really matters. Not only that, but how the life of our university is to be lived out each and every day and how we step into the future, which is here. That's just one reason why our cherished university reaches out now asking for the continued support of all of us, because in a whole new way, it is needed. One of Father Pilar's lifetime heroes has always been the British Jesuit missionary and martyr for the Catholic faith, Father Robert Southwell. In fact, it was his words that Father Pilar's chose to imprint on the exterior walls of the De Naples Center, where it is written, not where I breathe, but where I live, I love. And he does. It's a powerful message and a compelling invitation that Father Pilar so bravely lives out each day before our very eyes. He cited those very words in his inaugural address in the fall of 2018 when he commenced the second chapter of his presidency with his very much welcomed return to Scranton. As we gather this night, Father, I only hope you know how grateful Maggie and John and I and all are to have you at the helm and how you do indeed continue to inspire us. You call us all in the most Ignatian ways to examine our lives, to reflect on our use of the precious gift of time, to recognize that each and all of us truly are called to be transformed by the God who created us and sent us forth with a singular mission to be filled on our homeward journey. 
And with an event such as the one we gathered to mark this night, Father, you underscored anew for us what every single one of us should be doing and living our lives with grateful hearts and in selfless ways. So allow me, dear friend of so many, to conclude with the words of St. Ignatius, words which you so amazingly live out each and every day as we all strive to follow your good example and do our best to generally support your passionate love of this university and help sustain its life-transforming mission to educate and to launch the lives of our students that they might become people of conscience and compassion and commitment. Let's conclude with the words of St. Ignatius, who once wrote these words familiar to us all, but think of them in the context of tonight, of the lives that we connect with and the lives that are here being cared for at our university. Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not to ask for rest, to labor and not to seek any reward except that of knowing that I do your will. Thank you, Father Pilars, for teaching us all what those words really do mean. God bless you now and always as you move forward, transforming not only the university, but the world through God's redeeming love, one heart, one mind, one soul, one student at a time. And one last smile for those here and those who have so kindly joined us tonight from their homes. Thank you for making the virtual real. Thank you, Monsignor. Congratulations to you and again to Maggie and John. All three of you truly are deserving of tonight's recognition. I'd also like to thank your family and friends for all of the support that they have shown for tonight's celebration. I also want to thank our students for their participation in tonight's program. They continue to be the inspiration for our future. As I turn it back to Tim for the final update on our fundraising efforts and to close out our program, I want to thank all of you for tuning in tonight and for your generosity in support of our Scranton students. This truly was a new venture for all of us, but we were able to move forward confidently knowing of the wonderful support of so many of you who are with us year after year. We are hopeful that we will all be able to be with each other in October 2021 to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Until then, thank you, stay safe, and cheers. Thank you, Frank, for guiding us through tonight's program and for all that you do as our PBC chair. Thank you, too, to PBC Vice Chair Elizabeth Madden, our presidential scholars, and to Father Pilars. And how great is it to see our beloved Father Mack. Thank you to all who have contributed to tonight's fundraising effort, especially our sponsors. We are humbled by your continued generosity. And thank you to the over 600 connections uh, of folks watching us tonight. We, we greatly appreciate you joining us. And I know that that is more than the Quinn Mariotti family. Thank you, Maggie, John, and Monsignor Quinn for your support and congratulations on a well-deserved honor. Finally, this event was a very heavy lift for many of my colleagues in university advancement. And I would like to thank them publicly. Tom McKinnon, Mary Jane Rooney, Franny Mancuso, Sarah Efforts, Karen Menora, and Ashley Alt, and especially Tom Selitsky, who put all of our production together and whom I'm quite sure will remove me from his contacts after tonight. As we look at the current fundraising number, which does not yet include our silent auction results, I think it is good to recall that quote which started off our program. Your generosity tonight has taken that quote on the Scranton student experience one step further and reminds me of a favorite quote from St. Ignatius, that love is shown in deeds more than mere words. Yet again, 
our Scranton community has shown their love for this place in not only their deeds tonight, but in all that they do each and every day. We thank you all for joining us tonight and for your generosity. Thank you. And as we close, as we run our closing credits, we will be led into them by Wycliffe Gordon's premiere of the alma mater as an instrumental quartet arrangement that he wrote and performed. Thank you all. Until we hopefully see you in October 2021, stay safe. And to all those who are with me at midnight on PBC night, Happy New Year. Cheers. Take it away, Wycliffe.
beijo that 